September of 99, Bischoff was sent home by Harvey Schiller. He tries to come back in April of 2000 with Vince Russo. Uh, and then later that year actually tries to put together a deal to buy WCW. Of course, we know now none of that ever happened. And WCW was done after March 26, 2001. We covered all of that on our very last Monday Nitro edition. Uh, so go ahead and cruise over to the archives and check out the last Monday Nitro episode. Uh, Bruce, was there ever any consideration that you recall when Bischoff was sent home in 99 to trying to work something out to bring him in in either 99 or 2000? There was no, there wasn't. There was consideration to use Eric when we made the purchase of WCW. There was talk about uh, reaching out to him, seeing if he would be interested in coming in at that point. And I think that um, either John Laurinaitis or well, JR yeah. may have had conversations with him then. Let me get there. Once the invasion angle kicks off in the summer of 2001, it always seemed like to me as a fan, hey, it makes sense for Eric Bischoff to be the on-camera leader here for WCW rather than Shane McMahon. Uh, I mean, fans were conditioned to understand that this guy was actively trying to put the WWF out of business for years. And then in my research for the show, I learned that Jim Ross did call Eric in July of 2001. Uh, Eric would write about this in his book. And he says that Ross didn't pitch him much of an idea, but he did remember that the call came on a Thursday and they wanted him at TV on Monday. What was the idea here and whose was it? It was all of our idea. When we started talking about who would be the logical leader of WCW and who, who could be that guy that could shake things up. We didn't, you know, obviously we didn't want Nash or Hall or Hogan, uh, Goldberg sting. I said, we didn't want them. They weren't in consideration because of their contract status. So we were looking for someone that could be associated strongly with WCW that didn't have a contract, but also could make a splash. And we all pretty much unanimously agreed that Bischoff would be the guy if you could get him. And that was the first time, you know, and, and I got, I said, Johnny Ace, Johnny wasn't even with us at the time, uh, full time at that point. But, um, uh, so yeah, Jr. would have been the one to reach out and call him, just see if there was any interest. We wanted to see if he even would want to come in and do it. We didn't know that. It was just kind of one a, 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 a creative idea. What if on a call like that is money even ever discussed, or is Vince's move to get you to agree to come to TV and then just talk about that in person? Well, the first thing that you want to gauge is the interest. And if there's interest there, then they may talk, you know, ballpark figures, but the first phone call, that's strictly just going to be, are you interested? Would you like to do something? Can we talk further? Why would Jr. be the person to make this call and not Vince himself? Cause t Jr. was head of talent relations and that was his job. Do you feel like the conversation would have went better or differently had Vince picked up the phone instead of sending Jim Ross to do it? I don't, I don't really know. I, I don't think so because it just wasn't something that Eric was really wanting to do at that time. I don't think that anybody could have talked him into it or made it, made it any different. In addition, I don't think that Vince was that high on the idea at the time. He was willing, he was willing to see if there's interest there and then, okay, if there's interest there, let's see if we can work something out. But it wasn't, God, I've got to have this guy. What does it say about the way the WWE was working at the time to call him on a Thursday for a Monday show for a really big angle like this? Shit. We used to make calls on Saturday and Sunday for Monday show and say, what are you doing tomorrow? Can you, can you be in, in Detroit on Monday? Isn't that amazing? Uh, just the way the business is. Sometimes he'll be sitting there at dinner on a Saturday night and I've got to have Bishop. Get me Bischoff. God damn it. Where's Jr. Jr. I mean, that, that shit has happened so many times. I've had shit three o'clock in the morning. Hey, pal, what are you doing? I like titties and I like chocolate. Oh, my God. Fine. <laughs> what, are what? You, what are you doing? I'm just saying that the weird things come at weird hours and there's a lot of last minute shit. <laughs> 
Oh, gosh. In early 2002, we would see the NWO and the WWE. Only the two could come together. Also available in our archives. Did anyone pitch uh, Eric uh, to come in for that angle? It seems like it would have made more sense to have Bischoff say he was going to inject poison into the WWE and kill it rather than having Vince say that. Am I right? Yes, it was. And we did talk about it. Um, his name was brought up a few times and I believe that when he finally did come in, that was the third time. Third time was a charm, but, uh, yeah, his name was brought up. So you do think you reached out to him for the NWO angle? I believe so, but I don't think he was interested at that point. That was one of his hibernation points where for whatever reason, he didn't cover that in his book, but he does say the next call came in May of Oh two. When Kevin Nash reached out to Eric to give him a heads up that Vince was going to call Vince did in fact call the next day. Um, what was the original idea or is that what we wound up seeing was Vince calling in May to pitch the July debut of him as the raw general manager that he already have the brand split in mind, or what do you think Vince's motivation to call was here? Oh, definitely for the, the brand split in the GM role, because it was, we knew we were splitting the brands. Vince knew that he, he wanted these two figureheads, um, the original, the original, original idea was, uh, Shane and Stephanie to be the respective GMs, but he felt that had been done before and didn't really want to do that. So we were, we were just throwing out all kinds of different, different names and different ideas. So that was the idea there. If he was interested in coming in, um, do you know if they discussed anything besides, the future angle did they cover anything about the water under the bridge on that call no they didn't i'm curious about vince personally making the call because a few minutes ago when i suggested that i just felt like based on their history vince asking jr to call feels like i don't fucking care about this guy i have nominal if any respect for him see if he'll come in i don't care one way or another but when Vince really wants it here, he picks up the phone himself. It seems like a gesture like that could make all the difference in the world and landing something like this. And you've also got to wonder how motivated would JR be to actually get the deal done given their history wasn't the best in the world. Is that fair to say? No, business is business. And, and I think we've all been able to put our personal differences aside when it in the name of business to do what's right at the time. And going back to the very first time when Jr. called, Vince wasn't 100% behind that idea. He, he wasn't like, oh, my God, I've got to have Eric Bischoff. His, his feeling, and this is coming from me, his feeling was, uh, see if he's interested. If he's interested, then I'll talk about it. But, but right now, you know, it's mental masturbation. I don't even know if the guy would be interested in coming in. Feel him out. See if there's something there. Now, when he had a, a firm idea of what he wanted to do, maybe he felt that, you know, kind of like you're, what you're saying. Well, goddamn, you know, Jr. Jr. couldn't land him last time. Now I'll do it. So I'll call him. And Vince knew, Vince knew it. The other part of that, frankly, on some of these things was Vince wasn't always, I don't want to say comfortable, but there were certain things that he didn't share with everybody. So if Jr. was out there uh, pitching something, then that meant the whole world may know about it. More people than Vince would want to know about it. Vince making the call, Vince finding out for himself one-on-one, -on -one, it, it's a different vibe and a different feel. Not everybody was included on that. There were people on the writing team that didn't know. So obviously the angle here, as we mentioned, is going to be bringing him in to be the GM of raw, but was there ever any consideration to bringing Eric in for anything beyond on camera talent? He had no. been such wow. Just immediate. No, nobody ever said, let's put him on the creative team or let's find an office position for him. Never. Nope. Nope. Why was it? It was, let's, it was, it was, let's bring him in as a talent. Let's see how he does. Let's get to know him and find out what's there. He had a lot of baggage. So, I mean, unequivocally, that was ruled out, and that was made clear to Eric. It was also made clear to us that he's coming in as a talent only. He has no creative say-so in anything. 
Uh, he will be an on-air talent. That's it. Let me ask you, when you say he had a lot of baggage, I'm going to need you to give me some more detail there. Well, people looked at Eric as the guy that tried to put us out of business. And Eric was the one that was leading the charge on the WCW site, kicked our ass for a long time, and was viewed as the enemy. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Johnny Ace is with the company here. He was on the WCW side. Yeah. Well, Johnny the- Ace wasn't the one making the decisions to do all that. Jo- Johnny Ace wasn't with the company when they were kicking our ass. Johnny Ace didn't make those personal statements about wanting to put Vince out of business and put the company out of business. I guess here's what I don't so understand. There- if it was business and everybody understands that it's business and everybody can say that we would have done it too. How is he this scum of the earth? Because you're talking about the boys. You're talking about human beings here. We can, after the fact, you can look at it and say it's business and you can get over that shit. People do it every single day, but there were still people that just held a grudge. There were people that had been fired by Eric. They were working in the company that were like, fuck him. I don't want to work with him. Well, no, I get that. But I guess what I don't understand is there's people in the company who have been fired by Stephanie and have been fired by Vince and have been fired by Jim Ross and Johnny Ace. And they're all still there. Did the company not see any, I mean, basically what you're saying is the company saw no significant value in Eric's ability to contribute behind the scenes. No, what I'm saying is, is that there was no interest to bring him in, in any role other than a talent role to bring him in, get, nobody knew him on, from our point of view. I didn't know Eric. Vince didn't know Eric. Stephanie didn't know Eric. Jr had worked with him, didn't have a necessarily positive view of him. Um, other than that, there weren't a lot of people that had had a lot of dealings with Eric from that side. The ones that did had a negative viewpoint of him. And most of them were wrestlers and, and people that had worked for Eric and had a negative experience. So to protect Eric as well, You bring him in as a talent, you put him on the same level as everybody else, and you let him ease his way in versus, oh, God, Eric Bischoff's in charge. What the fuck? Is this going to be another, uh, their viewpoint of what it was at WCW? It was just simply to protect him and to say, you know what? We, We don't even want to discuss that yet. Let's bring you in here. Let's see what we got. See if it works out. See if you like us, if we like you, and then we'll go move on from there. Okay. Time out. Let's talk about the perception of Eric Bischoff. I think everybody agrees that that kind of changed once he joined the company, meaning for so long, there was such a bitter rivalry between WWE and WCW that it felt like, Hey man, this guy's our enemy. He's going to put us out of a job. He's trying to, he's trying to kill our livelihoods. And then. They realized he was just one of the boys. He was just an employee like them. He was a contractor rather. Sorry. I guess I said the wrong thing there, but yeah, I I think that's interesting that the dynamic could change really quickly, rather quickly, because once upon a time, I mean, people thought this guy was the devil, (laughs) you know, he's here, he's our immortal enemy. And now he's part of our traveling circus. He's part of our family. And I don't know that there's been a lot of other times where something like that has happened in wrestling. In fact, I can't think of any, I mean, I know once upon a time, Bill Watts was fighting, you know, to keep his territory alive, but I don't know that he was like real competition for the WWF at that time. It felt like mid South was going down and the WWF was just a rocket ship then. So when he came in, it wasn't really competition and he he didn't stay long. Probably the same thing with, with Jerry Jarrett. I don't remember there being a time where the perception changed, but I can't help, but wonder like, what if, what if it went the other way? Do you ever think about that? Like what if Vince lost, what if WCW won and WCW bought the WWF would Vince have shown up and been a character on nitro? How would that have worked? I mean, (laughs) Would, would all of his quirks worked and, and sort of a booking committee we've heard about what an interesting cat Vince McMahon is. I, I don't know. It's just fun to sort of think about if the shoe was on the other foot, I, I can't imagine it. It's, it's impossible for me to imagine him strutting ass out there doing that. Mr. McMahon walk on nitro. 
I mean, even if I try, I can't see it. So, so yeah, I don't think anything like this has ever happened. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.